passage, if you have your Bibles with you, it is from, we start in Matthew 19. We start in Matthew 19, verses 13 through 15. You can read there. Actually, I want you to read the story. The story I'm going to read is found in three Gospels. I'm cheating a little bit. I'm going to read the story from the book of Mark. I want you to read it in Matthew 19, and there's a reason for that, okay? Matthew 19, 13 through 15 is where you'll find it. Just trust me on this one. Matthew 19, the way Mark puts it, in Mark chapter 10, he says, and they were bringing children to him. Him is Jesus, of course, so that he might touch them. But the disciples rebuked them. You'll see the word right there is rebuke. I want to pause for a moment. Do you know what the word rebuke means? The word rebuke is a word that is very powerful. Sometimes we don't appreciate how strong this word is, but we're, the word rebuke is not a gentle reminder. It's not when your child is reaching for the biscuits and they've already had two biscuits, you know, don't want them to have any more, and, and they start reaching for a third, and you say, hey, hey, I said only two. That's not a rebuke. That's a reminder. That's a correction. A rebuke is when your child takes an implement and starts reaching for the electrical socket and is about to shock themselves, and you jump, you say, no, 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 don't do that. That's a rebuke. A rebuke has power. The word rebuke is not used often in the New Testament. It's very rare. And, and it's even more rare where the word rebuke is used towards people, especially from Jesus. So when you see the word rebuke, don't think of it as a gentle thing. It's a powerful, sharp, emotional response. So the disciples didn't gently turn the children away. They rebuked them. They said, what you're doing is wrong. Don't bother the master. He's too important for you. Then Mark 10, verse 14 says, but when Jesus saw this, he was indignant. There's another powerful word. Indignant, again, is not a gentle word. It's not a simple Jesus telling the disciples, oh, disciples, it's okay. Don't worry about it. Indignant means Jesus had fury within him. Usually when we think of the word indignant, I, in my mind at least, I think of the phrase righteous indignation is where we often use it, right? And when you think of Jesus and righteous indignation, what is the first Bible story almost every Christian comes to immediately? It's the story in the temple, isn't it? And how did Jesus show his, he was indignant in the temple? He made a whip out of cords and started chasing people. Threw tables over, money went flying, animals went scattering everywhere. Lots of noise, lots of shouting. It was a powerful time. That is what indignant means, okay? It's not a gentle word. When Jesus saw what the disciples did, he didn't become mildly annoyed. He became indignant, furious. And that changes how we read the next words. Usually we think of these words as gentle because we like to think of Jesus as gentle. And he was, but not always. These words were not a simple, quiet, permit the children to come to me and do not, do not hinder them. No. They were, permit the children to come to me and do not hinder them. For the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. Truly, I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a little child will not enter it. Now I ask you, why did Jesus become so upset in this story? Why did he become so angry? Did Jesus overreact? Well, no, I don't think so. Jesus was perfect. I don't think he tends to overreact. But he did react strongly. Why did he begin become so angry that if you remember the last part of that phrase, he actually threatened the disciples' salvation? Why did he get so angry to do such a thing? To understand why Jesus became reacted so strongly, we need to know what happened before this story. That's why I had you turn to Matthew 19. Now I want you to turn the page back and go to Matthew 18. We're going to see what happened in the days right before this story happened. Now in Matthew 18, Jesus and, and his disciples, again, this story is found in the, in the first three Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, Matthew 18, Mark 9, Luke 9. As the story begins, Jesus and the disciples on their way up to the northern part of Israel, a, a city called Capernaum. 
As they're going there, the disciples are having a discussion. They're having an argument. There's, and, and they're doing it out of Jesus' hearing. They, they're, they're, they know they shouldn't be having this discussion, but, but they want to anyway because they're human. And we should relate more to the disciples than we do. If we were there, very likely we might have been doing this too. But they're arguing about something. They get to Capernaum and Jesus says, hey, hey guys, what were you dis- discussing on the way up here? And they were so embarrassed about it that no one would answer Jesus. Now, if you've ever been a parent, you know you have those moments, you, you catch your children doing something, what were you doing? And when they won't answer, you know they were doing something wrong. And that's what's going on. The two of them, or two of the Gospels, no one would answer. Finally, in one of the Gospels, it says one of the disciples got brave enough to answer Jesus. And I always imagine it's Peter because that's the kind of guy he was. And I can just see Peter kicking his feet saying, um, Jesus, um, uh, Jesus, we were wondering, um, I'm just going to say it, Jesus, after all this time, who's going to be the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And I can imagine Jesus saying, oh, yo, oh, Father, these men you've given me to work with, are they never going to learn? And I'm not making this up in the book of Luke, Jesus sits down to answer the question, okay, it's in the Bible. And I can just imagine how frustrated he was. It's Matthew 18, it's not Matthew 10, he's been teaching them for a while now. Won't they learn? In the book of Mark says he gathered a child. All three gospels say he gathered a child. Uh, Mark says he picked him up, held him in his arms. In Matthew 18, 3, he says, Truly, I say to you, unless you are converted and become like children, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. That's strong, isn't it? Those are some powerful things. That that is not the answer the disciples were expecting. Uh, Jesus was going to be the greatest. Well, I'll tell you what, unless you turn and become like a child, you're not even going to enter the kingdom of heaven. That's a shocking answer. Jesus was good at those, wasn't he? But what does he mean by this? Jesus just did something here that was groundbreaking, that was world-shaking, revolutionary. He raised the status of children. We don't usually think of children as an example, do we? In fact, it's usually the other way around. Children, why are you behaving so, so immature? Why do you have to act like that? Why can't you grow up? We even have an expression when someone, when an adult is being, is being immature. You're being childish. It's an insult. Jesus turned it around. Stop being so adultish. Stop being so, don't, don't act your age. Act like a child. He turned it around. He made children the the example, in fact, not the example, but the standard that we have to reach in order to enter heaven. And what is it that he's talking about here? Usually people talk about the faith of a child, but that's not actually what he's talking about in this passage. In fact, Scripture never specifically talks about the faith of a child. Indirectly it does, but that's not what Jesus is speaking about in this passage. To learn what he's talking about in this passage, we have to read the next verse. Matthew 18, 4, whoever humbles himself, as this child, he is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Do you want to be great in heaven, friends? Do you want to be great in the kingdom of heaven? Then you need to humble yourself. Become like a child. Now what does that mean? What does humility of a child mean? Well, if you're going to be humble like a child, the first thing that means is you need to be under someone's authority. We don't always like to hear that. I want to do what I think is right. I want to do what I feel is the right thing to do. No, the Bible says you need to be under someone's authority. Even pastors are under the authority of others. You want to be great in the kingdom of heaven, you need to be humble like a child. That means when you do wrong, you need to be humble enough to be corrected. That means you need to be humble enough to be disciplined when you do wrong. That is what it means to be humble like a child. Also, it means you need to be willing to learn. That is the humility of a child. Jesus goes on. The next verse, Matthew 18, 5, whoever receives a child like this in my name receives me. Church, do you want Jesus in your midst? You want Jesus in your church? You need to receive children. It's that simple. Jesus said it right there. Whoever receives a child like this in my name receives me. 
So you know what Jesus is doing some, here is he's, he's, he's again turning the paradigm around, changing the world view. He's raising the value of children. Not only do we need to have children because they're fun, we need to have children because Jesus commanded us to. We need to have children because children are part of the Great Commission. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to all adults, no, to all creation. We need to be reaching children. See, all the time I go to churches and I, I, teach, I do seminars training people how to work with children. I go to Bible colleges and I teach courses on children's ministry. I come in and I preach on children. And, and all the time people come up to me and they say a phrase to me. And I know they mean well, but it almost breaks my heart every time I hear it. They come to me and they say, Richie, I, I believe in children's ministry because I believe kids are the church of tomorrow. And I know they mean well when they say that. But that that expression is not healthy. And it goes against what Jesus is saying. When you say, I believe in children's ministry because kids are the church of tomorrow, you're saying that children only have value in the future. You're saying that children are only an important part of the church for what they bring years down the road. Jesus said no. Anyone who receives a child like this in my name receives me. He's saying children are not only the church of tomorrow. They're an important part of the church of today. Children are an important part of the church of today. That means when we think about ch church, we have to include the children and the youth in our thinking. That means when we do programs to reach out to others, that means we have to not just think of how to reach the adults, we have to consider how to reach the children. When we have our services, and one of the things I love about First AG is everyone is valuable here. You have programs specially designed to reach the children, the youth, the men, the women, the elderly, everyone is, is an important part of this church, and I love how inclusive this church is. Not all churches do this. I've been to churches sometimes that say, yeah, we'll accept children. They can come in through the back door and go to their program. We don't want to ever see them in the sanctuary. I'm not making this up. I have been to churches that say this. Jesus said, children are the church of today. But that goes further than what I've just said. In fact, when I said you, when you have outreaches, you need to consider the children, you need to consider them on both sides of the outreach. Not only are we to reach children, if children are part of the church, we need to use children. They need to be a part of how we reach out to the community. We need to believe that they are capable of sharing the gospel with their friends. We need to believe that children are capable of sharing the gospel to adults. I did a VBS at, at Bethel AG one year, not too long ago, and one of the children came up to me and he said, you know, Richie, I was listening to what you said and, and, I'm, and I believed it. On our way to church this morning, th there was a, an old woman who was begging. And I went to her and I said, I don't have any money. Does this sound familiar? I don't have any money. But let me tell you what I do have. I have the love of Jesus. And I want you to come to our church so you can hear about Jesus. And that morning, that old lady who was begging at the corner visited church for the very first time. Because a child had the faith to speak out. And let me tell you what, children will do that only and when we believe in them. When we train them when we equip them by, by teaching them how to do it, and then when we trust them and send them out. We need to involve children as a part of the church. Jesus goes on, Matthew 18, verse 6. But whoever causes one of these little ones who believes in me to stumble, it would be better for him to have a heavy millstone hung about his neck and drowned in the depths of the sea. Isn't that a beautiful verse? <laughs> you know, I go into people's homes all the time. I was in, in someone's home yesterday, and I look around, and, and there are Bible verses all over the place, isn't it? And verses like, as for me and my household, we will, we will serve the Lord. Verses like, I will rise on wings like eagles. You see these verses all, have you ever found this verse on someone's wall? No. We come to these verses, and we try to skip them, don't we? They make, them uncom they make us uncomfortable. But we shouldn't skip the verses that make us uncomfortable. Those often have some of the most powerful messages. And there are some powerful things in this message, in this verse here. But whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me. 
Never doubt if children can have a relationship with Jesus. He said it right there. Children can believe in me. But then the next, ver- the next two words. The, the part of the verse that people get uncomfortable about is the drowning part. That's not the part you should be uncomfortable about. It's the next two words that should make you uncomfortable. Whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin. Church, that means children can sin. And according to the Apostle Paul, the wages of sin is death. If children are capable of sin, then children are culpable and are worthy to be sent to hell. That is the part of the verse that should make you uncomfortable. And it should. It makes me uncomfortable. That is the reason I do what I do. Because so many churches focus only on reaching the adults or the youth and they ignore the fact that children need Jesus too. I know of churches in this city that will separate the children 10 years and under, send them to go play before they ever talk about what Jesus did on the cross. And my heart breaks because what if something happens to one of those children? And no one thought they were worthy to hear about Jesus' love. If children can sin, then they need a savior. Oh, Pastor Richie, you're, you're seeing too much into this. You're, you're reading what you want to see. No, why else would Jesus say having a giant millstone on their neck and drown them in the depths of the sea if the crime committed was not one of eternal consequences? Jesus doesn't say things like that very often. There's a reason we don't hang those verses on our wall because we don't serve a God of hatred and anger. We serve a God of love. God is love. But sometimes his love causes him to be angry. And it's that crime of eternal consequences that brings up God's fury. The good news is, though, he said also in that verse, children can believe in him. Children can sin, but they can be saved. If we will have the desire and the the passion to reach out to them. Now we're going to skip ahead a couple of verses. We're going to come to what I think is one of the most beautiful verses in all of Scripture. Matthew 18, 10. See that you do not despise one of these little ones. For I say to you, their angels in heaven continually see the face of my Father who is in heaven. Now for many years I didn't understand how powerful this verse was. It wasn't until that year, 2016, as I was studying, that it struck me how intense this verse is. See, when I arrived in India back in 2009, I began to do some research, and I came across some statistics that are terrible, and and I've done research even in the last year. It's not much better yet. Little improvement, but not much. These statistics told me that 60% of children in India are being physically abused. 60%. It said that one in three children in India are being emotionally abused or neglected. These statistics are not just some random organization. They come from the UN, from UNICEF, in partnership with the Ministry of, uh, to Women and Children of India. Together they did this study and they found two-thirds of children are being physically abused. One-third of children are being emotionally abused or neglected. 51% of children in India are being sexually abused. 51%. That breaks my heart. In the U.S., when I went through my bachelor's and my master's training, they they teach you how to respond to a child who's been abused in case you come across such a situation. Now, the numbers in the U.S. are higher than people are led to believe. It's closer to about one in five but they teach you what to do just in case. Whenever I get in front of a group of children here in India, my heart breaks because I look out and I realize one half of them are living through a hellish life that they should never have to live through. Something God never intended for them. 
and it breaks my heart. It breaks my heart knowing that even as I look out across here, those statistics are not new. Half of the people in this room may have been abused growing up. And my heart breaks for you. And maybe you, like the children of today, were in the dark in the corner saying, God, where are you? Don't you know, don't you care about what I'm suffering? That's what makes this verse beautiful. For the angels of these children are in heaven continually with the Father, sharing with them. God knows every tear that falls. God knows every harsh word that passes their ears. God knows every blow, every injury done to their body. God knows, and I believe God weeps. And I don't know why he doesn't always step down and intervene immediately. I, I, know, I understand that he gives man free will and, and we do evil, awful things with the freedom God has given us. But God weeps at the pain caused these children. And God did do something. Every time the children is neglected, every time they're mistreated, belittled, abused, God knows and he cares. And that's why the next verse is given in the scriptures, Matthew 18, 11. For the Son of Man came to save that which was lost. Now we use this verse often in evangelistic settings to, to talk about how Jesus came for the lost, and that's true. But in the book of Matthew, this verse is about children. Did you know that? Jesus came for children who are lost. That's part of why he came. That was part of his mission on earth to make sure that no one misunderstood, to make sure that we grasp that this really is what he's talking about, Jesus then gives us a parable. Matthew 18, 12 and 13. He says, what do you think? If a man has a hundred sheep and one of them goes astray, does he not leave the 99 on the mountains and go in search of the one that is straying? If it turns out that he finds it, I tell you the truth. He rejoices more over it than over the 99 which did not go astray. You know, we use this verse in children's ministry because it's about animals and sheep and it's cute and all of that. But we forget that this story is actually about children in the book of Matthew. Again, maybe you're saying, oh, Pastor Richie, you're a children's ministry. You're seeing things that you want to see. Look at the next verse, Matthew 18, 14. And so it is not the will of the Father who is in heaven that one of these little ones would perish. Remember, Jesus is holding a child in his arms as he's saying all of these things. It's not the will of the Father that one of these little ones should perish. Jesus has just given the disciples a lot to consider, a lot to think. First, if you want to be great in the kingdom of heaven, you need to become like a child. You want Jesus in your midst, you need to welcome children. You, children can believe in Jesus. Children can sin and fall short of the glory of God, but God, Jesus came for those who are suffering. Jesus cares about the children who are hurt. He came for them, and it is not the will of the Father that one of these little ones should perish. Jesus cared for children. And at the end of Matthew 18, they leave Capernaum and they start a journey down south to the region of Judea. We don't have record of what the disciples were talking about on that journey. And I wonder sometimes if maybe there wasn't much conversation. Maybe they were processing and thinking about all of this new thinking that Jesus had just given them. Matthew 19, they enter into the region of Judea. They come into this city. And, and usually when we get to that story that I shared earlier in Matthew 19, we always picture it as a beautiful scene, peaceful scene, don't we? If you go to Google and look up images for it, I've done this before, it always set in a beautiful garden with, with a rainbow in the background and butterflies flittering around, maybe a dove hovering somewhere near Jesus' head and everyone's all happy and smiles. That is not the way the Bible described it, okay? Get that out of your mind. That's not what happened. They get into the city, and Jesus is out there in the courts, and as always happens, the, uh, the Pharisees try to trap him, and they start asking him questions about divorce, because that was a hot topic even 2,000 years ago. They start asking him questions about divorce, and Jesus answers the questions, and then 
they leave the, the city gates and they go into someone's home, not a garden, someone's home. And as they're talking in the home, the disciples are disturbed by what Jesus had said. Let no man tear apart what God has put together. And the disciples say, Jesus, what is it even worth getting married then? And, and men don't listen to that, okay? That is false teaching from the, from the disciples. And, and Jesus put them straight very quickly. Let me agree with what's, what, the, what Solomon said. He who finds a wife finds a good thing. Women, uh, my wife, I, I, I can't imagine where I'd be right now without my wife. She is, she is one of the, the, the best blessing God has ever given to me. Je Jesus is talking to the disciples back and forth. No, uh, talking about why marriage is good and why divorce is bad. And in the middle of the discussion, it's not completed. You read it carefully. All three accounts, you can tell that there's more that the disciples want to ask. But all three accounts say then or and then some children were brought to him. Remember this setting, they're in someone's home. And I don't know about you, but my children love when company come to our house. When they were younger a little bit. Now they're 12 and 14, so this, they're, they're a little more mature now. But, but when they were younger and we had company come over, they would love to say, look what I can do. Listen to this song I've been practicing. Listen to this Bible chapter that I've memorized. Watch this dance we've been preparing for so cool. And they'd go on and on showing off and, and, and uh, dancing and, and entertaining our guests. And finally I'd have to say, kids, this is my guest. You go to your rooms. I want some time with my friend now. I imagine children in Jesus' day were the same. And I imagine Israel was a lot like India, very communal. It probably wasn't just the children of the household, but children from the neighborhood. It's Jesus, after all, who's come into this house. Of course they want to see him. And the parents bring their children to Jesus so that he can lay his hands on them and pray for them. And the very first chance the disciples have to show that they learned what Jesus taught in Matthew 18, they blow it. They mess it up. They don't gently turn the children away. They rebuke the children. Get away from here. Don't bother the master. We're having grown-up conversation. Can't you tell? It's too important for you. Now, yes, children are not appropriate to having a conversation about divorce, but still, they rebuked the children. All three Gospels use the word rebuke. And then Mark Mark 10, 14 says, Jesus was indignant. He had just taught them how valuable the kids are, how much they are part of his mission, how they're part of God's heart. And the first chance they get, they mess it up. The word indignant, it, in the dictionary says, it's a feeling characterized by or expressing strong displeasure at something considered unjust, offensive, or insulting. It's when you see something that is so wrong, you cannot sit still. It's when pastor saw someone beating a girl on the street and had to say, what are you doing? That is indignant. You can't sit by and let it happen. You must intervene. And Jesus didn't gently say, let the children come to me. No. He said, permit the children to come to me and do not hinder them. He was furious. He was angry. Let them come. Doesn't it speak to how incredible Jesus' character is that he can be this angry and seconds later children are swarming around him? Doesn't that speak to how much love flowed through him even in his anger? Permit the children to come to me. Do not hinder them. Two parts to that command. It's not enough just to let them. You mustn't hinder them. That means when you have programs, you must remember the children or you are hindering them. That doesn't mean you always have to separate them. You can have family times together. You should have family times together, but don't make them just the same as all the other ones. Include the children or you're hindering them. When you plan the budget of the church, remember the children's program or you're hindering them. When you do outreaches, involve the children or you're hindering them. Permit the little children to come to me and do not hinder them. For the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. Now in theology there's a debate as to exactly what the kingdom of God is referring to. Some people think the kingdom of God is talking about heaven. And if that's the case, praise the Lord, there's going to be wonder law in heaven. And, uh, and merry-go-rounds and slides and, and all these things because apparently heaven was, belongs to children. 
The other theological stance is that the kingdom of God is talking about the church here on earth. And if that's the case, the church was made for children. It belongs to them. Now, don't misunderstand me. I will never say one ministry is more important than the other. I am not saying children is the most important and only ministry of the church. What I'm saying is this. It is no less important than any other ministry of the church. And when we make it less important, when we think of it as simply babysitting, when we put it on the side as an afterthought, we are violating the very word of God. We need to reach out to children. And then Jesus says this at the very end, Matthew 10, 15, and Luke uh, 18, 17, have it word for word exactly the same as each other. It says, truly I say to you, whoever does not receive a child like this in my name, I'm sorry, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child will not enter it at all. Does that sound familiar? Have we heard that somewhere before? Isn't that the very first thing Jesus said back in Matthew 18, 3? Unless you're converted and become like a child, you will not enter the kingdom of God. I don't think it's an accident that these passages have the same teaching at the beginning and at the end. I don't think when the Bible was put together, these things happened to fall there and God said, oh, that's convenient. No, God planned for that so that we would know we're to understand these teachings together. Church, we must value children. We must care for those that are hurting and suffering just as Jesus did. We must remember the children when we reach out. We must remember to involve the children in the work of the church. Or have we made the same mistake the disciples made? Have we put them as a second thought, as an afterthought? Have we put them as something to do only if there's extra time? Only if there's extra money, then, then we'll hire someone to come in and play a video for the children. Have we done that? If so, then we need to confess. And we need to make our hearts right. Let's pray.